As we talk about the history of Jesus Christ, whenever we talk about the history of man, man begins in a point of time. There was a time when man did not exist, when woman did not exist. We read about the marvelous beginning of man and woman in Genesis 1, and in greater detail in Genesis the second chapter. I'm convinced of the fact that there was a time when there were no cherubim and no seraphim, no Gabriel, no Michael, no angel in heaven. They were created beings. They also began to exist in a point of time. But whenever we talk about that great and good second person of the Godhead, we do not suggest that he began in a point of time. In fact, he is just as eternal, just as everlasting, as is the first person of the Godhead, and as is the third person of the Godhead. When Micah told us the place where the babe would be born, Bethlehem, in Micah 5 and verse 2, he described him as the one who was from of old, that is, from everlasting, quite literally in the Hebrew, from the days of eternity, suggestive of his eternal nature. I believe that's the significance of the statement that he makes in John the 8th chapter and verse 58, as he announces, before Abraham was, I am. Notice the tense of the verb, was connected with Abraham, but that marvelous am connected with the Son of God. I believe that this is what the Hebrew writer had in mind when he affirms in the very last chapter, Hebrews 13 and verse 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. I have worked on that precious memory verse with a number of children, and I sometimes suggest let's put a little bit of action with that verse. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, that's back this way, and today, that's right now, and forever, that's out there in the future. Another wonderful manifestation on Paul's part of the eternal nature of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Jehovah's Witness people are just as, as much in gross error as they can be when they try to convince us that Jesus is a created being, that he is not eternal in nature. They often have knocked upon my door. I'm glad to talk to them at any time. But I insist that we talk about your view about Jesus Christ. They're not programmed to begin there, and they really don't want to stay there very long. But I insist that this is one of the areas, if we're going to discuss matters, we're going to discuss whether Jesus Christ is eternal, my view, or whether he is a created being, your view. Jesus Christ is eternal in nature. The eternal word, and that's how John describes him in John 1, verses 1 through 3, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That eternal word became the great agent of creation. Not only do we see that here in John 1 and 3, Paul affirms the same in Colossians 1, 15 through 17, how that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things made or created that are in heaven, that are upon earth, whether they be visible or invisible, and all things not only were made by him and for him, but all things consist by him, that is, are held together by his tremendously great power. And the same is taught in a number of other places in the Bible. And so he who was the eternal word became Jehovah's agent of creation. I'm convinced that many of the references in the Old Testament talking about the angel of the Lord are really references to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not in the sense that he's a created being, but in the sense that he became Jehovah's messenger as he came to the earth and brought messages and performed missions of mercy on behalf of the first person of the Godhead. I believe that if we read carefully Exodus the third chapter, as well as Stephen's allusion to this in Acts the seventh chapter, 30 through 38, we'll see that it was the angel of the Lord that spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. Hence, not the first person doing the speaking, but the second person doing the speaking. And you'll remember that he referred to himself as the great I Am. 
and the one who is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And the second person of the Godhead could lay claim to that just as easily and accurately as the first person could. And so many times in the Old Testament, he is the great angel of the Lord. Also in the Old Testament, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of prophecies of a precise and pinpoint nature talking about his coming to the earth. I've often thought that a person could write a beautiful and a very accurate biography of our Lord just by taking the prophecies about him in the Old Testament. Not only that, but Jesus Christ, when he came to the earth as God's only begotten Son, and I believe that he became that in a point of time as the great drama of of redemption is being unfolded, when he came to the earth as uh, the incarnate Son of God, he came to fulfill marvelously and minutely and with precious perfection every one of these prophecies in the Old Testament. For 33 years he tabernacled here upon the earth, at the end of which he died, he arose again. After some 40 days he ascended back to the Father, and some 10 days later he became king, taking a sitting position on the right hand of Jehovah God, and he has reigned over his kingdom from that day until now a position that he will continue to sustain as long as the Christian age shall last, at the end of which, when he comes the second time, and mundane affairs, as we know them, will be brought to a conclusion, he will then, according to Paul's declaration, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28, hand the kingdom back to the Father, and throughout a never-ending eternity, those who have been redeemed by the blood of him who died on Calvary will have as their eternal refrain and as the ever-enjoyable chorus of the song, Worthy Art Thou. And this is a quick uh, thumbnail list of our Lord from uh, the eternal past until he comes the second time and on to eternity itself. But the gist of our lesson tonight is going to be about the third of a century that he remained upon the earth. Are you aware of the fact that we cannot turn to a single passage of Scripture that says he lived here upon the earth about 33 or 33 and a half years? We know from Luke's statement in Luke the third chapter that he was 30 at the time that he was baptized. We count the number of Passovers that he observed in John's gospel record, and we arrive at the approximate date of 33 to 33 and one half years encompassing his stay upon the earth, when he pitched his tent among men, when he was made like unto his brethren in all things, when he was the Son of Man here upon the earth as well as the Son of God, with a perfect blending of both his deity, which he had had from eternity, and his humanity, which became his at a point in time. As we look at the life of our Lord, we have uh, the first 30 years, and these are years of preparation. In the early chapters of Matthew and Luke, and these are the two writers that give us our information in regard to the pre-birth announcements about John, who was going to be the great messianic harbinger, and the coming birth of him who was to save man. And we read about these pre-birth announcements in Matthew 1 and Luke, the first chapter. We read about his birth in the latter part of Matthew, the first chapter, as well as the opening part of Luke, the second chapter. He was born in Bethlehem. One of the speakers this afternoon made mention of the Mormon mistake, where they have him born in Jerusalem. I had a young Mormon elder, I don't think he'd shave very many times, but he sat in my home one afternoon, and I asked him about Joseph Smith's era. I said, looks like Mr. Smith could at least, with all of the evidence set forth in Micah, and then in the two New Testament books of Mark, or rather Matthew and Luke, looks like he could have gotten the city of our Lord's birth correct. And he said the same thing that the speaker alluded to this afternoon. Well, Bethlehem's only a few miles to the south, 
But uh, Micah did not say that he would be born in Bethlehem, or rather in Jerusalem, and neither did Matthew or Luke. They pinpoint the place as Bethlehem. And so Joseph Smith, with all the information in the Bible, couldn't even get the Lord's birthplace correct. That doesn't say much for a man who claims inspiration from God. But when Jesus was born, the shepherds were advised of this. They were keeping watch over their flock by night, and they immediately began to make preparation to go into the city and see this wonderful thing that the Lord had made known unto them. Remember, the shepherds came the very day of his birth. Commonly, around December 15th through December 30th, we have manger seasons all over this country depicting the wise men and the shepherds coming at the same time. Somebody really hasn't done much of his homework and that kind of thing. The two groups did not come together. In fact, the wise men did not find him at the manger. There are certain events that have to fit in in Luke, the second chapter, before the coming of the wise men, because immediately after the wise men left and went their way back home, Joseph took the child and Mary, his wife, and hurried them into the land of Egypt, where they remained until the death of Herod, that horrible man who had sent out a decree for the Christ child to be killed, as well as other innocent male babies in the Bethlehem area. And so the wise men came sometime later, maybe weeks later, maybe months later. I know that they did not come together. We don't know much about the early life of our Lord. Luke gives us an insight in the latter part of Luke, the second chapter, especially at the age of 12, when he makes a visit to the city of Jerusalem with Joseph and Mary. After they had finished the days of the Jewish feast, they started back home, thinking that Christ was in the group, missing him at day's end. That's the end of the day, not the name of the famous motel chain. <laughs> missing him at the end of the day, they began to retrace their journey. And they found him uh, not in some kind of brawl, not in some drinking spot, not in a gambling den, not in a place where immorality reigned. They found him in the temple, talking with the Jewish leaders. Mary slightly reprimanded him. And then we have his first recorded statement. Indeed, a marvelous one. How is it that you sought me? Wister, know you not that I must be about my father's business? or about matters pertaining to my heavenly Father. And Mary kept all of these things, pondering them in her heart. And then we see something about the submissiveness of our Savior at the age of 12, as he stands upon the threshold of entering into his teenage years. He is respectful of parental authority. After all, he lived under the Ten Commandment Law, one of which said, Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, Honor thy father and thy mother. And he went down with them to Nazareth and was subject unto them. A little lesson that I've taught boys and girls in children's classes all over this nation has to do with five reasons why you ought to obey dad and mother as you grow up. Number one, God commands it. Number, number two, Jesus practiced it while here. Number three, it's right. Number four, it will enable you to live longer. And fifth and finally, they, your parents, deserve it. We're told that betwixt 12 and uh, uh, 30, 18-year period, that our Lord advanced or grew in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and man. This could certainly be called the ideal education. It's the complete education. There isn't any vital matter that is omitted. And then after this, our Lord enters into his personal ministry. According to Luke, the third chapter, he's now 30 years of age. And John had already begun to do his work as he came among the teeming masses of the Jewish people, preaching a message of repentance, baptizing those who were willing to repent and willing to confess their sins. We read about John's mission in Matthew the third chapter, Luke the third chapter, Mark the first chapter, and John the first chapter. But Jesus made the trip from Nazareth to the place where John was baptizing. We read about this in the latter part of Matthew the third chapter. And he came for the express purpose of being baptized. 
John, sensing that there was something uh, very unusual about this situation, he knew enough about the one that had requested baptism that he said, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Jesus said, Suffer, or permit it now to occur, for thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. And he suffered or permitted it to be done. When Jesus was come straightway up out of the water, the Spirit came in dove-like form upon him, and there is a voice from on high suggestive of God's approval. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3 and verse 17. Immediately after that, the Spirit drove or led him out into the wilderness where he was to be tempted of the devil. After a forty-day fast, the devil came and said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones that they turn to bread. Immediately the brilliant mind of our Lord went to an Old Testament passage, Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the scene changes and takes place, the second round, of the confrontation between Christ and Satan, now on a high pinnacle of the temple. And again the devil said, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. And then he goes to a quotation from Psalms. I never have believed that he quoted it correctly. He left out a vital part of it. But he said that he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and their hands shall they bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And again, the mind of our Lord went back to another statement made by Moses, this time in Deuteronomy 6. Thou shalt not tempt or make trial of the Lord thy God. Now the locale, the locale changes from the high pinnacle or wing of the temple to an exceedingly high mountain. And here the devil, and this must have been the ace up his sleeve, he said, If thou will fall down and worship me, then everything that you see, the kingdoms of the world and all their attendant glories, will immediately become your prized possession. But Jesus was not in the buying business. Too many times we are as we survey the wares that the devil is saying, and we always come up on the losing end when we decide to buy what he is selling. Again, our Lord went back to Deuteronomy 16 and quoted to the effect that thou shalt um, worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. That's Deuteronomy 6 instead of 16. And so three times our Lord met the arch enemy of mankind, and three times he came away as the victorious one. Then we have the beginning of his ministry. As far as the miraculous is concerned, as far as the preaching is concerned, as far as the great service that he will render to mankind. Knowledgeable students of the life of our Lord have often divided that magnificent life into the geographical places where his ministry occurred. One of these would have been the Judean ministry, another the Samaritan ministry, another the Galilean ministry, another the Perean ministry, at the end of which he comes back to the city of Jerusalem where the final week occurs and uh, then the greatest day of the history of the world to be followed by another great day, the day of his crucifixion and the day of his resurrection. Let me say just a little something about the Judean ministry. In the latter part of John, the second chapter, as since it is Passover time, he comes to the city of Jerusalem. And there he cleanses the temple, which he'll do about three or maybe a little more than three years later because the job didn't stay done. He had to do it again at the end of his ministry. But John's the only one who records the first cleansing of the temple. After that, he performs a number of miracles and convinces a number of people that he was more than just a mere man. John closes the second chapter with the observation that the Lord did not have any need that man should testify of what was in man because he knew all men, which he did with absolute perfection. Uh, a man by the name of Nicodemus is properly impressed. He becomes the nighttime visitor to our Lord. John, the third chapter. 
And he approaches the Lord with the statement, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus immediately gave him a lesson about the new birth. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Well, even if Nicodemus could have the second physical birth, would no more have put him into the Messianic kingdom than the first physical birth did. Jesus is not talking about a birth, even of a first or a second, from his mother's womb. He's talking about a spiritual birth. And he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now the Judean ministry, since Jesus will come back at the various festivals or feasts of the Jewish people, there will be many occasions when he'll come back to Judea and the city of Jerusalem in particular. He's in the city of Jerusalem in John the 5th chapter, and again in John 7, 8, 9, and 10. He comes to Bethany in John the 11th chapter. In John the 12th chapter, he comes near the time of his own crucifixion, and uh, the rest of uh, the chapters in the book of John, for the main part, deal with the work that our Lord did in the Jerusalem area. And so John, more than the other three, will give us the information about the work that he did in Judea. But also, he made some trips into Samaria, one of which we read about in John the fourth chapter. Now remember, western Palestine was divided into three main provinces. Judea is the southern province, Galilee is the northern province, and sandwiched in between is Samaria. In the early part of John 4, Jesus is traveling from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north, and he must needs go through Samaria. There occurred the visit with a Samaritan woman, left, left nameless by the Holy Spirit in John. But soon he convinces her that he's the Messiah, and with this great spiritual eureka, or her great discovery of his Messiahship, she immediately rushes into the city and quickly convenes a great audience to accompany her. And Jesus, by the great weight of the wisdom of his words, as well as, as his powerful presence, because there's no record that he performed a miracle here among these people, no record of raising the dead, no record of uh, helping the sick to be well again, or making blind eyes to see. Simply upon the basis of what he taught, he convinced the Samaritan people that he indeed was the Savior of the world. And he did it in about two days. And they had far less advantages in their favor than Jews to the south did or Jews in, to the north in Galilee did. A little bit later on, he'll come to Samaria again, the latter part of Luke, the ninth chapter. This time he'll not get a very good reception because his face is set as though he would go to Jerusalem and the Samaritans would not allow him to come into the village that he planned to visit. In fact, this stirred up the arm of James and John and they wanted to call fire down from heaven and destroy that rebellious Samaritan village. The Lord did not allow such. He had not come to destroy, but to save. And then we have uh, the Galilean ministry. Now really, Matthew, Mark, and Luke have far more to say about this than John does. As I've already mentioned, John majors in the work that Jesus did either in Jerusalem or in Judea. I know that John has some to say about his work in Galilee, the great bread of life discourse in John the sixth chapter is a, a sermon that Jesus gave in the Capernaum synagogue. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke have... Uh, the, as their thrust, the Galilean ministry. And Luke, to a great extent, from about Luke the 10th chapter, he deals with the Perean ministry of our Lord. Now, Galilee had been home to our Lord from the time that he was a little boy. He had grown up there. Nazareth was his home, and Nazareth was situated in the land of uh, Galilee. In the land of Galilee, he did some of his finest preaching, performed some of his mightiest miracles. 
He selected 11 of the 12 apostles from Galilee. Judas Iscariot, literally a man of Kiriah, seems to have been the only one from Judea among the 12. And so it was from among the Galilean citizens that our Lord selected the 12 or 11 of the 12 men. But during the Galilean ministry, he'll perform great miracles. He'll do some tremendous teaching. He will have powerful parables that he will set forth. For instance, there are the parables about the kingdom in Matthew, the 13th chapter. He'll deal with his enemies from time to time. Our Lord becomes the greatest controversialist the world has ever known. He was not of the disposition of one man, one preacher about whom I heard, who said, I'm not going to preach anymore on that which is controversial. Well, I feel sorry for that man's soul when he comes to face God in the day of judgment. In fact, there's not a great deal that he can preach from the Bible, but what is controversial to some people somewhere at some given time. But our Lord did not mind uh, entering into controversy. Alexander Camel said that when Christ was baptized, that on the banks of the Jordan he uh, unsheathed the sword of the Spirit and he threw the scabbard away. And that's an excellent appraisal of what our Lord did. Error was never at home in the presence of our Lord. Truth always had a mighty champion in him. Our Lord believed in standing for the will of God. That was the very thing that had brought him from heaven to the earth. During his Galilean ministry, he visited many of the synagogues in that area. On occasion, he would turn to the north and go up close to Tyre and Sidon. At one time, he visited the Mount Hermon area and uh, announced that Caesarea Philippi, which was in the shadows of that tall, towering uh, Mount Hermon, that upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. It was during his Galilean ministry that he took the three, the inner three, and went up to the high mountain, and there he was transfigured. And it was upon that occasion that the Almighty said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. When Peter referred to this in Second Peter, the first chapter, he used this as a part of the Greek construction, that this is the one in whom I have always had great approval and great delight. A wonderful argument in favor of the eternal, eternal nature of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. After the Galilean ministry, our Lord engaged in the Perean ministry. Now, Perea would be beyond Jordan, on the other side, on the eastern banks of the Jordan. It was a rather tiny country, as you can see if you examine it on a good map of Bible lands. But Jesus uh, spent some time there. And many of the events that are recorded in Luke 10 through the next several chapters have their basis here during the Perean ministry. Again, from time to time, he'll come back to Judea and to Jerusalem, not only for the observance of the Jewish feast, but on one occasion he came to raise dead Lazarus from the dead, about that which we read in John the 11th chapter. But as uh, matters are quickly coming to a close, the hour of his passion is approaching. He came, to he came to Bethany, or rather he came to Jericho, where he visited the home of Zacchaeus, and on to Bethany, and they honored him with a supper, maybe on Saturday night before he entered the city triumphantly the following, Saturday, or the following Sunday. But uh, during the final week, our Lord on Sunday had the triumphant entrance into the city. On Monday, he cursed the fig tree, cleansed the temple a second time. He had done that at the early part of his ministry. Now it needed to be done at the closing part of his ministry. I've always thought that Tuesday was perhaps the busiest day of his entire life. In fact, we don't have a record of what Jesus did except perhaps on just a very few of the days of his ministry. Brother J.W. McGarvey said that John, what he recorded, only occurred about 30 different days in the ministry of our Lord. 
It's no wonder that he closed with the observation that if everything which Jesus had done had been written, even the world itself could not contain the books that should have been written. But Tuesday was a very, very busy day. It was a busy day of meeting the enemy, the Pharisee, the Sadducee, and the scribes of the day. It was a day in which he unmasked the hypocrisy of uh, the Pharisees, Matthew the 23rd chapter. It was a day in which he gave some powerful parables. It was a day in which he gave the great Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25, in which he discussed the destruction of Jerusalem first and then his own second coming. And then we come to Wednesday and there's nothing recorded about what he did that day. Thursday, they come together for the observance of the Passover, at which time he institutes the Lord's Supper, and from the upper room they go out, crossing the Kidron Gorge to the east of the city, and then climbing a little bit up the western slopes of the Mount of Olives, coming to the quietness and the serenity of the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prays with great earnestness and where the invading mob uh, arrest him, and Judas places the traitor's kiss upon the precious face of our adorable Savior. They hurry him away, and he appears before Annas and Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, and then they hurry him away to the Roman officials, Pilate and Herod, and Pilate again. Pilate, being the Roman governor, finally gives way, in fact, the voices of the multitude prevailed, according to Luke, the 23rd chapter, and he gave the directive that Jesus be carried out and crucified. And we read about his crucifixion. All of the four writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record it. Nailed there at 9 o'clock in the morning. At 12 o'clock, there's darkness over all the land until 3, at which time he yields up the ghost or the spirit, Remember, he had declared in John 10, No man takes my life from me. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. He is buried by the loving hands of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Friday afternoon, the rest of that day, all of Friday night, Saturday, and Saturday night, he remains in the tomb. Early on Sunday morning, Mark 16, 9, he arises from the dead. He makes five appearances on that resurrection day, and then for the next 40 days, he'll make something like five or six more appearances. And then at the end of that 40 days, he'll go back to heaven on high. Some 10 days after the ascension, he will establish his, his kingdom, his church upon the earth which he does in Acts, the second chapter. Thus we have, in a rather short period of time tonight, crossed in chronology. I think there are many wonderful advantages to studying our life, the life of our Lord, in a correct sequence. We get all that each writer has said about any one event, and sometimes only one will mention it, sometimes all four will cover an event. For instance, we have to uh, take what all three, Matthew and Mark and Luke, say about the rich ruler in order to come to the conclusion that he's rich and that he's young and that he was a ruler. I believe that if people would study the chronology of our Lord, they never would have fallen into the arrow thinking that the wise men and the shepherds arrived at the same time. That's a failure to put all of the necessary data that we have or the material available and to come to right conclusions about this line. I have long believed that a chronological study of our Lord's life is one of the most effective ways of studying it. Back before God was outlawed from university campuses as he is today, I had the privilege in the 1960s to teach for university credit at the University of Tennessee in Martin some religious subjects. I taught an Old Testament course, and for a number of years I taught the life of Christ. And we always approached it from a chronological account of his life. I had about 10 or 12 weeks, three days a week, an hour of each session to do what I've tried to crowd in to about 35 or 38 minutes tonight. But if you're here tonight 
and have never obeyed the gospel, the cross that I've talked to you about tonight is the one who has commanded us to hear his word. He's the one who requests that we believe in his deity, that we repent of our sins, that we have enough faith and courage and conviction to confess him before men with a promise that if we confess him in the here and now, he will confess us in the there and then. And then he's still on record as saying, you have to be baptized. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Yet these are the conditions of entering Christ in the church, and the condition of staying there is a life of faithfulness and a life of service. 